here in Scotland where I'm based and also a couple of our student representatives from cohort nine, which is our current cohort who have just started here in Scotland. So I'm really uh, a very warm welcome to you all. I've got a little bit of housekeeping. I'm sorry, I have to say this. I've got a housekeeping at the start um, before we get into um, all of the rest of the programme. So as I say, I just need to read out that um, for house housekeeping um, terms, the event is anonymous um, unless you have joined the programme using your name. Now the name may be publicised when you ask a question. So when you type into the chat, the Q&A box um, that hopefully you'll see on your screen, um, that if you have signed in with your name, then that your name will show in that. So if you want to edit your name right now, then please go ahead and do that. So you can remain anonymous in all of this because this recording or this session will be recorded. We found last year that we had you know, 50, 60 people join live and then another 100 or so watched it after we aired it. So please do just make sure that if you want to remain anonymous, change that name that you signed up with. Um, as I said before, just a, another reminder, please use that Q&A function um, to ask your questions and type in at any point. You don't have to wait until the end of the hour. If you think of a question, just type that in and Dr Kumar, Kumari will be checking those questions as they come in and publishing them so everyone else can see them and then she'll be coming to me and our student reps and maybe Dr Kumari herself will be able to answer some of those questions. I hope so. So you'll have a full team uh, response. So I think that's all using the Q&A. Um, oh, and then, as I say, just to remind you, please, um, if you want to have a look at this um, session after we've finished, just use the same link that you joined with today. Just go and click on that same link and it'll take you to the recorded session. So you can go back, share it with your family, with your friends, have a little think about it. And then if there was something that you just thought, oh, I just can't quite remember what was said about that then you can come back and have a look again. So I think without further ado, that's the housekeeping over and done with. I'm going to now share my screen. I've got a short presentation that will probably only take about 15, 20 minutes, if that. And then what I'm going to do, we'll just open the floor to questions, um, potentially um, Jaffa and Edith, or oh, Via, sorry, as she's known, um, they might want to sort of share some of their experiences um, with you about applying for the course and filling out the application form and things like that. But we'll come hopefully onto that um, after I've just um, shared with, my, with you my presentation. So here we go. Hopefully everyone can see that and see all those smiling, wonderful faces of um, some of our earlier cohorts. Um, I think the one thing that everyone comes back to me with every year and all the course, all the guest scholars that we have and the lecturers, they just say it's just such a wonderful course. It's got a real family feel to it. And we do bring students um, from all over the world. And, you know, Via and Jafar will maybe talk to you a little bit about that because some of our students, they've never left their country before, they've never left their time zone before. So it's a huge life change. It's a massive change for them. But my goodness, um, they make the most of it on the whole. And as you can see, um, this is a whole, uh, I think this is our cohort four, I think, just on the beach, on the back beach, which is just a stone's throw from our wonderful um, facilities that we have here in Scotland. So as you're aware, ACES Star, it's a European funded program through the Erasmus Mundus scheme. Um, the University of Crete are the coordinators. And then as us here at SAMS, we're part of the University of the Highlands and Islands. And we're also got Nantes University as well with us. It's a two year, truly international program, I think, in terms of the students that we get and the topics that we cover. Um, it provides a truly global learning environment um, and it reflects basically the nature of this industry. Um, aquaculture is not uh, by any means um, located just here in Europe. 
many of you will already know, I work uh, extensively with the seaweed aquaculture business, where pretty much 90% of the seaweed aquaculture occurs in Southeast Asia and China. So um, aquaculture is no, no means um, limited in its ge geograph ge geographical extent. It's found, you know, and takes place all over the world. So um, ACES Star itself was funded by Erasmus Plus through the Erasmus Mundus scheme in 2022. And we were given um, a grant of around 5 million euros. We, uh, this uh, ACES Star though is not uh, the first of its kind. It has built on previous projects. So it's actually the third um, of its type. We started off back in 2014 with ACES, the ACES program. Then it went to ACES Plus. Now it's ACES Star. So um, if anyone has any suggestions for the next ACES program, we're thinking ACES Global or something like this. But we've had a really wonderful track record and have attracted in over, I think, around 11 million euros altogether since the um, since 2014. Um, and we get back some wonderful comments from the reviewers saying how much this course is needed and what a wonderful breadth of information and knowledge is provided to our students. So we have uh, 135 students now from 42 countries that have been through the ACES family, the ACES program from its, its start. And as I said, the core partners are the University of Crete, who are the coordinators, um, uh, SAMS, which is partner of the University of the Highlands and Islands, and we also um, act as the um, where the application because we are the first semester. Um, the applications for students come to us, and we take care. We lead the um, selection committee, um, and there's also Nantes University that is a core partner. So basically, three centres of excellence within Europe um, that. Um, oversee the running of this program. But on top of the core partners, um, we also have what's known as associate partners. And we have 63 of those, which entails basically international experts from across the globe that we can call on to help us with um, the provision of this course. So our associate partners, they can provide guests, uh, they, they've come um, as guest scholars. They provide us with facilities for student dissertations, for student internships, um, for a whole host of other things. But the students don't have to go to them for their um, final semester, which is the dissertation. I'll come on to that in a minute. But I was trying when we were when we were looking for associate partners, I was trying to get an associate partner for from every continent in the world. And I think we've sort of managed that maybe maybe not so from Antarctica, but from every other continent. So I've got a map of where they are a little bit later. Now, um, we have quite a few questions, obviously, each year about the actual scholarships themselves. And for the ACES Star program, we were awarded 81 scholarships, um, Erasmus Mundus scholarships, which are, and these being the fully funded ones. So they, those scholarships basically cover your tuition fees and your insurance. And then they give each student 1,400 euros per month, per calendar month for the full two years of the program. So um, that's over, yeah, so that's, that's a really, um, quite significant, I think, stipend that is awarded. And obviously you can ask the students questions themselves, but most of the students that we talk to say that that 1,400 euros does indeed cover the majority of their expenses, the accommodation and travel and visas and things like that. That does cover the majority of their expenses while they're conducting this course. Um, the other um, new thing actually with ACES Star is that we were also awarded partial scholarships and we were awarded 40 of these and those partial scholarships cover the tuition fees only. So other living expenses and allowances and day to day living you would have to cover yourselves. But we do have these partial scholarships also that are available. So we've actually found that students that have applied for the full scholarship 
but haven't been selected for that have then gone on to take up the partial scholarship places. So, um, so just to let you know, we had 19. Um, we yes, we generally have cohorts of between around 18 to 26 students each year. So we're not talking about hundreds of students coming in, and I think that's sort of pretty um, common for masters programs to have that those smaller cohorts, and it means each of the students get obviously that much more sort of individual attention throughout the course. So in September 2022, we had 19 Erasmus Mundus students starting and they, in fact, are now have they've now just um, started. Well, no, they are in Nantes at the moment and they're thinking about their dissertations, which will start over um, next next uh, in February. Um, and then we had 25 Erasmus Manta students and Via and uh, Zafar, who were joined us today, they started here in uh, this September just gone. So their cohorts got 25. So that's around about the average number that we generally have. Um, in terms of how the programme is structured, the first semester you would spend here in Oban, which is a beautiful town of around 10,000 people on the west coast of Scotland. We are really very much slap bang in the middle of the uh, salmon industry. You know, we have uh, salmon farms literally within a stone's throw of where we are based. Um, we are very much in the thick of things, so that's great. So that would this is where you would spend your first semester. Then your second semester, you would move to uh, Crete in Greece, the island of Crete. Which is very beautiful. Slightly larger university um, where you would join um, the Department of Biology. And I should actually, I'm sorry, I forgot to say in Oban, it's very much um, when you're here, it's just about a sort of foundation level, bringing everyone up to the same standard, um, but also dipping into the sort of environmental interactions of aquaculture. We've also got optional modules on algae, micro and, mic uh, micro and macro algae, on governance and various systems um, involved in the aquaculture industry, and also um, information technology and systems, which we hope will run this year. Um, so there are a number of optional modules as well here. But yes, in Crete, when you move in the second semester, that's very much more finfish um, based. Um, there are a number of core modules there. I won't go into all of the core modules, but you can find more information on detailed, you know, detailed breakdowns of the different modules that are available on our website that's shown there at emm-aces.org. So please do go to the website and, and have a look at these things. Then semester three is where you will go to France, so to Nantes. Um, northwestern France, again, another beautiful place in the heart of the oyster and bivalve aquaculture industry um, here in Europe. So the French really do love to eat their oysters. So you will be um, off very early in the semester down to the down to the local shellfish market to um, pick up your shellfish to bring back to the lab um, to get into the sort of dissection from very early on. There's lots of practical work. Um, as I say, throughout throughout the programme, particularly in um, semesters two and three. So then the final semester, semester four, it says optional on the screen. Well, semester four is your dissertation and it's the optional is very much where you want to do your dissertation because we have had many students go all over the world to do their dissertation. As I said earlier, we've got 63 associate partners spread out all over the world that you can go and join for your dissertation. We have uh, a number of other connections with other universities that are not on that associate partner list that you can go um, and spend your um, dissertation period with. The dissertation actually lasts from February through to the end of June. It's not a full six months, but it's not too far. So it's a it's a reasonable length of dissertation where you can get a good project done. And we have had a number of students now that have published from that dissertation work that they've done. One student, I think, in the end got three papers out of his dissertation, which was remarkable, but it's usually uh, one or two papers. So um, so that fourth semester is where you can really fly and you can, um, you know, we've had students 
in uh, Vietnam, we've had students go to China, we've had students go to Brazil. So it's not just restricted either to doing your dissertation in the uh, in the European Union. The only restriction is, is if you have a full Erasmus Mundi scholarship, you are not allowed to go back to your own home country, unfortunately. You know, the Erasmus Mundus scheme is all about spreading your wings and growing your network. So it's about going and visiting other countries and immersing yourself in the culture there. So if you did go, you could um, and if you so you're not allowed to go back to your own home country, unfortunately, and you mustn't spend more than three months outside of the host partners or the host countries. But that's fine. We've had students go to China, as I say, in Vietnam for three months collect in their field data, do their sampling or whatever it is, and then they come back to the U European Union, to their host partner um, to do their write up and um, they, and carry on whatever lab work they need to do. So it's it's absolutely possible to, um, as I say, do that dissertation pretty much anywhere in the world if you want to. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I was talking about the, the associate partners, so 63 of those and as I said earlier, they have been wonderful throughout um, the period, um, throughout this ACES program. And we've had um, guest scholars, some top CEOs, some top um, professors from various universities, from various organizations such as the United Nations University, from the FAO, from World Fish, from um, the Canadian government environmental environment agency over the years. So we do try to bring in um, guest scholars that cover maybe some of the gaps that we maybe don't were unable to cover to sort of a very detailed um, degree. So we bring in these guest scholars to really sort of add that extra um, shine to the course. Right. Um, so just to talk about the um, the actual scholarship and the scholarship applications then. So for this coming um, application round, we have 37 full Erasmus Munda scholarships available, 37 left, and we have 38 partial scholarships. So remember the full scholarship also pays that monthly stipend of 1,400 euros. So that's the full scholarship. The partial scholarship does not cover that, but it does cover your tuition fees and tuition fees are 2,500 for European and UK students per year. So remember, it's a two year course, so 5,000 altogether euros and international, it's 5,000 euros per year for international students. So the partial scholarship does cover those fees. It just doesn't give you the sort of monthly living allowance that the full scholarship does. Um, so that's what's available for this coming round. Um, applications open on the 4th of January. You can still go onto the website. The forms are there. You can download them, but the actual physical allowing you to send in those applications doesn't open until the 4th of January. So there's lots of time over these holidays, over this festive period for you to spend crafting that application. Um, it then closes on the 4th of February. So it's just an, uh, a month that it's open, but it doesn't mean that you can't start thinking about your application now. And as I say, on the website, there is, um, is details there for that. And maybe some of you have questions, you know, what, what, what do I need to write in that application? Um, you know, what, what's the key messages I should get across? And I think that's probably where Via and Jafar can help you. Um, and we'll come back to them when we uh, finish this short presentation. OK, thank you. So, yeah. So the other thing is, please remember that there are other scholarships out there. There may be scholarships um, from your own individual country. If you if you are unable to get um, selected through the Erasmus Mundus Scholarship Program, we've had students that have been have have been awarded scholarships from their country. So maybe do check up on this. There's maybe um, some scholarships, or maybe a company that you're working with already. Maybe they may offer to help cover some of your costs in exchange for you going back to work for them after the program is finished. We've had students that have done that or partially done that 
as well. So just have a think, you know, please, if you don't think or if you don't get accepted, I hope hopefully you would. But if you don't get accepted for an Erasmus Munda scholarship, don't give up. You know, there's the partial scholarships and then there are other funding um, sources. And on our website, again, there are lists of potential other funding agencies that you could approach to help cover those or some of the costs. OK. So this is just a map just to show you um, where some of our ACES alumni come have come from. And as you can see, I'm still desperate to get some students from Australia. Don't ask me why. Australia has got a wonderful aquaculture industry and we've yet to have any applications. We've had two fantastic students from New Zealand, but none from Australia. So um, we're doing uh, pretty well for the States. Um, South America, we're still keen. Um, as you, yeah, as you can say, as you can see, Japan. We nearly had a student from Japan, but unfortunately he couldn't make it in the end. But um, but please do, uh, you know, we'd love to fill this map up entirely, to be quite honest, um, at some point. But uh, yeah, so we've been really, it's it's wonderful. And you can really see the sort of global nature of the programme. And what we do try to do is set, um, set sort of discussion groups or set sessions where each of our students contribute and tell us a little bit about their background. Um, so so experience is shared and we are very um we really sort of promote that um between our students i hope Vera and, and jeff are agree with that that we um we we always try to get the students to um you know present give presentations on different countries around the world so um so we're bringing in all of that additional knowledge provided by um that would be provided by yourselves as well into the course to make it truly global so that's just where the alumni come from. And that just gives you an idea of where our associate partners are based. So as you can see, they're sort of spread out all over the world. But I, as I say, there is nothing to stop you um, taking an internship. We've just had a student, um, one student did his, in, you have um, a three month internship now at the end of semester two, which runs from, May, June, July, no, June, July and August. June, July and August is a three month internship. Um, it used to be just six weeks, but we realised the value of these. So one student um, from the previous cohort went to Japan. Another one has been to Australia. Others stayed within Europe. So again, for these internships and for your dissertation, you can choose to go where you want to um, in the world, obviously. Um, obviously. Uh, you need to find the resources to do that. We can't pay for travel to Japan, um, which is a bit of a shame, but we have had students that have used their budget wisely and have been able to travel to these um, distant places. So that's to do with our associate partners. Um, just on my final uh, penultimate slide now. So employment, we get quite a lot of questions about this. And um, I every year sort of delve into and I I, I love tracking. <laughs> the students love love me this. I I, I track, I, I love to follow them in their careers and I write reference letters. I probably write between 25 and 30 reference letters every year for ACES students um, who are applying for PhDs and other jobs in the industry. So it's lovely to keep up with the careers and follow everyone and what they do after their after they leave the program. So during the programme, we've got, and we, I think we're reasonably unique in this. We run a, a module um, between um, ourselves here at the University of Highlands and Islands and University of Crete. We run a, a module called Professional and Entrepreneurial Skills. And that is all about training you for the world of work, training you for after what happens, um, for what happens after the, the ACES programme is over. So networking skills, presentation skills, um, interview skills, writing CV. We just did that yesterday, <laughs> uh, VHF, writing your CV, um, preparing you for going for interviews, for applying for jobs, and then for when you're actually in the world of work. So that happens throughout the course. But then we've found, um, we're, it's, a, it's a wonderful statistic, but 100% of our students basically enter employment within three months of finishing the programme. 
there is that much demand for skilled labor within the aquaculture industry and other industries. But I think the employers and the feedback that we've got from employers has been extremely positive. Um, and doing a little bit more analysis of where people are going, we're sort of finding around 45% of our students are going into the industry, going into government agencies, environment agencies, something like this, or working for non-government organisations. We've got World Fish, FAO, uh, or you know, just giving an example of fin fish production managers. We actually actually we actually have three um, uh, Aces alumni working within ten miles of us here in Oban in one of the largest salmon hatcheries in the UK, if not Europe, I think. So three ACES alumni have stayed relatively local to us and have been snapped up. That's a Scottish sea farms um, no, um, salmon hatchery. So um, when then the others, and we've had some go back to their universities and become lecturers, professors, what have you. Um, but we have also the other sort of around 55% do go on to um, attain PhDs, either in the UK or Europe, or international. So it's it's kind of split. And you can see that from very early on when I ask the students what, what their career aspirations are. You sort of have a half that would like to go into the industry, another half that would continue in research. And it's nothing, you know, and we have had others that have gone in, done a PhD and then gone into the industry because the aquaculture industry has, um, particularly in some of the fin fish areas, has a large um, R&D. Um, have a large R&D sector where where PhD students um, then then um, enter. So um, I think that is uh, the end of where I would like to stop speaking. Um, just to say thank you all so much for coming again to join us. And and then we're sort of moving on to the question phase. We've got another half an hour, which is good because um, there's always some good questions that come in and. Hopefully, I'm just wondering, um, Pooja, is there any sort of anything that that Via or Jafar, anything to do with sort of the applications that have come in at the moment? Or should we just, is there anything that has come up for me during that session? Yes, there is one question, but it is not about the application. It's okay. just a general overview, like what uh, we think about the, there's one uh, of the attendees who is interested in doing work in microbiology and gut health in aquaculture. So oh. he he or she wants to know our opinion. On this, so I just say that it's one of the right place and right course if they want to do anything about gut health in aquaculture and fin fish or salmon or anything. It's an advancing and a hot topic. If you want yeah. to add anything further to that. <laughs> please. Yeah, thank you so much for your question on that. Obviously, um, gut health, uh, fish welfare, yes. all of those subject areas are covered in the second semester when, when you go to the University of Crete. That is something that they excel in. There is a microbiology team there that works specifically on gut health in, in, um, in mainly in sea bass and sea bream. Um, but there are other connections that we work with here as well in Scotland, other institutes. So if there is something, if that's in a particular interest, then it may be some, maybe that um, you could come back and do a dissertation project in that in that field. There's nothing um, to stop you on that. Um, but that's a good question. And I hope that has answered it for you, but please do um, take a look at the indicative content. So when you go into the ACES um, web page and click on, um, I think it's program, and then you can drop down. Semester two is the one that's at the University of Crete, and that will give you some more detail of what the type of um, subject areas are that are covered at that in that semester. Yes. Um, Peter, are there any other questions at the moment? People being no. shy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sure uh, the, uh, there's an, another question on the same, asking same thing, similar. OK, OK, well, similar hopefully micro, we'll just, Yeah, yeah, we yeah. have uh, answered that. Yeah. OK. Um, there was another question that came up, I, I think, um, last year, which was to do with insurance that I didn't put in those slides, but quite a few people are uh, wonder about insurance. And um, so when you have 
um, when you if you are lucky enough to get an Erasmus Mundus scholarship, then you will be automatically covered and it will be paid for for you won't need to cover that. So that will be um, paid for and delivered by the doctor. It, we usually use Dr. Walter. They've got a very good reputation. We've used them from the very beginning and it's I think it's called um, via Jafar. Is it Worldwide Pro Plus or something? is the is the name of the insurance that you're that you have and we've had I think we've had a few maybe four or five students that have claimed on that insurance throughout the course of the program and they've never had I've never had any complaints it's always been paid and dealt with very swiftly so we've we've continued to go with this Dr Walter Pro Plus so but if you get a partial scholarship or your self-funding, then it is something that you have to, have to factor into the cost of the program, um, is to make sure that you have, you're fully insured for traveling between our countries. And if you go abroad, then you obviously will take out extra insurance for that. But there are various student insurance schemes that you would be able to um, apply for. Um, so that covers insurance anyway. So any anything else? No, not at the moment. OK, that's no. fine. So this is maybe where I can have a bit of a chat with um, put put Via and um, Zafar exactly. on the on the spot here. So um, just the two of you, how did you um, how did you find the application process? What you know, people will sort of say, because I think there's two parts, isn't there? There's a motivation statement. Yeah. And then there was another section on why you want to do the project or, you know, can you talk about a bit about what you put in those sections? Can you remember going <laughs> it's probably a little while ago, but can you remember sort of what you did, what you what you said in those? Yeah, I, I kind of remember um, being, you know, putting all my life, my life story kind of, and I just um, basically put why I love aquaculture, why I am, I really want to have this scholarship, just this sort of thing of, of and of course, just be truthful, just be truthful yeah. of who you are, of what you want, and why do you want this scholarship, and why do you deserve this scholarship? Yeah, that's really good yeah. answer. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. yeah actually, yeah, actually, in my case, uh, when I'm uh, doing my af after my bachelor's, I'm searching for for some master's degree, and on the same time, I'm also uh, I was also working on a project that is actually work on seaweed and bivalves. And when I got I got this uh, program, ACES program, and I uh, go through all those uh, uh, websites, and I saw there have uh, seaweed related modules, there have bivalve related modules where I have some interest. So I just found that and I would like to align all those uh, all those from my previous work with the program and how uh, that's how I prepared my uh, motivation for this program and that's worked. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and it worked. It sure did. So, um, so did you? Because I think when we're looking at that motivation sort of section for that, it's really is you know, looking to see if you've done any work experience or you know if you've done any courses. You know, really bringing out the fact that you've you've chosen. Because I think Via and and Jeff, I, did you choose? Did you had you already done undergraduate sort of modules and courses in in an aquaculture or fisheries related? topic area for undergraduate? Yeah, of course. Uh, in my case, uh, I have uh, many experience in aquaculture uh, during my bachelor's. Even in my internship, when I complete my bachelor's, uh, they also have some work on finfish. So it's like, yeah, I have a little experience though. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Via, Via, you were going to say something there as well. Yeah, we, we also have these subjects. But I have classmates, so just for those people who doesn't have any kind of experience. So I also have classmates who just graduated. So please don't be intimidated if you don't have any experience at all within the industry. So um, I really want you to apply even though you still don't have that experience. And yeah, but for me, I have that I have subjects in my undergraduate and my thesis is also about aquaculture. Yeah. Thank, thanks, Fia. That's a really good point that you made there. Yeah, you don't have to have experience in the 
in the industry to be able to get get through to get an Erasmus Mundus scholarship. What we're just looking for is that you've maybe got undergrad, you've done undergraduate modules that are in maybe marine biology or marine chemistry or or um, fisheries or aquaculture or along, you know, some modules that you've done and then some maybe there is just something that you found, maybe that's a particular professor or maybe you did your research, your undergraduate dissertation or thesis on an aquaculture related subject. And it's really made you then think, ah, you know, this is something that I, I would quite like to do at master's level now. It sort of sparked your interest. And that's what we want to hear about in the in that motivation statement that you put in there. Yeah. So what did did you um what did you think about, you know, obviously English language and the IELTS and things like this? How do you know speaking did would, was that a little bit off putting or did you did you talk to other people and and did they help you with that? Uh, for me, actually, I applied last year without the IELTS because I remember asking question because I also um, joined this Q&A session last year and I asked you if it's fine to apply without IELTS first. And thankfully, thankfully you said it's fine as long as you will have the IELTS if you will be um, offered the scholarship. So yeah. when I have the scholarship and I have read my email, uh, I was so um, I was so happy. I I literally cried, but after that, I booked an IELTS appointment yes. after that. So I just have like two or three weeks of preparation for the IELTS. And yeah, hope, uh, unfortunately, I have a passing score. So I think if you just have like the basic, the basic knowledge for English, I think you're good to go. Yeah, yeah. So I think with the IELTS, there's yeah. various different categories, aren't there? And for what we say, you need to get a minimum of six score of six in each category, but I think 6.5 overall. If you don't get 6.5 and you're just on the six overall score, then please come back to us and talk to us because it's not the end. It's not like a deal breaker and we can make a special case and it can be that you get extra help when you arrive here in 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 Scotland with your English. Um, but um, Zafar, did, Jeff, yeah. did you have any? What were your experiences there? Yeah. In my case, it's like uh, before you were going for a seat for a IELTS exam, it may seem like a very hard one. It's quite hard, but honestly speaking, you are doing your bachelor's in English and you have uh, experience uh, in writing in English, experience in presenting presentation in English. So it's not a big deal. It's like a format that you need to follow. So in my case, when I just finished my bachelor's, I have uh, plenty of time in my hands, so I have a plan like that. Yeah, uh, let's see what happened. Then I, 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 I went for an exam and it's, it's worked well and I got a good score and applied mm -hmm. by this way. It's not a big deal. Like it's, 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 it's a thought that you can crack it like a scholarship. So just go for it. And we also mentioned that it's not mandatory to have your score before applying. You can you can go for for later, so uh, it's quite convenient in our program and the score is not so high like 7, 7.5, 6 and overall. So it's quite uh, quite flexible, I think. Yeah, yeah. because it, it costs money, doesn't it? I mean, it costs yeah, money to take the IELTS. So exactly. you need, to, you need <laughs> yeah. to obviously, if you don't have it already, you need to find out, you know, you need to find out that you've got the scholarship. So you know that you've got the, the money potentially there. Um, so then you've got the scholarship and then you go and take take the IELTS. Um, it used to be that you had to have the IELTS before you applied, but we kind of relaxed that a little bit more now. But um, obviously the the letter of acceptance is conditional on you getting that IELTS because um, you need that to get the visa to, to get into the UK. Yeah, so sure. um, that's important yeah. that you do have that in the end. So so yeah, so interestingly, so what were there any other things about the application process? I mean, were there or the application form or sections in the form that you that you could give some advice on or some top tips of how to succeed in getting your application through? Obviously, you did, but are there any other? Was there anything else that you could yeah, recommend? I, I can mention actually uh, two points that uh, actually worked a week. Well, in my case, for example, uh, uh, preparation of SOP statement of purpose is a, a vital one for preliminary select 
selected for this program. So whenever you would like to prepare your SOP, I would all the time suggest my juniors and any people who would like to take suggestion from me, I would like to say that you have to prepare SOP uh, that you have previous experience or if you have no experience you have experience in taking some courses in your undergraduate level or any level so always try to align your uh, modules your work experience with the aim and objective of the program so that they can correlate that you were actually interested and you would like to enrich your knowledge in further next level and if you were then selected for the preliminary stage, then the most cracking uh, and most important thing is like facing interview. And in interview, I would like to say be prepared, uh, take whole modules uh, at, at a glance in the website and be confident and and try to be be, be uh, normal. It's, it's not like a it's not like a answering questions. They will give you mark everything. It's not like that, but be friendly in the conversation then you I, I, I think you will uh, will be able to crack uh, the interview and mostly interview is very important to get this scholarship at all so that, that are my two advice thank you Jeff I know that we had a session yesterday didn't we in the professional yeah. skills all about interviewing and, yeah. and you brought up some of your some of the comments that came out from the ACES interview because for some of you the ACES interview is maybe the only interview that you've ever done um, in your lives. I was talking, you know, with some people and we were saying, you know, usually please, um, we try to make the interview. So there are, yes, it's two steps. So you put in your, your, your paper application, or not paper, you submit the application form. And then we go through those and we look through the motivation statement. We look through your grades. We just look through whether you are suitable uh, and you are highly motivated enough to get through to the course and that your English is up to the right sort of level. And then or your written English anyway, is up to the right standard. And then we then select from that, then we select to go to interview. And we usually interview um, between 40, 40 uh, what does it say, 45, 40 to 50 students every year that we interview. And we always make sure that um, it's usually myself or a colleague as a male and a female um, professor that is on the interview panel, just the two of us. And we keep it as informal, don't we? I, I hope nodding. We keep it as informal as we possibly can. Um, so and if if for some reason, um, please don't be worried about your Internet connection. Obviously, we interview people from all over the world with a variety of different Internet connection qualities. Um, please do obviously try to make sure that you're somewhere where you know that the Internet connection is good. Um, but if for any reason we can't contact you or the internet goes down partway through the interview, we will always try to get back to you and set another time, set another. So please don't feel that, um, oh, my internet connection's awful. You know, there's no way I can attend the interview or what have you. So don't worry, don't worry about that. Um, also, yeah, in terms of, Via, do you want to say anything about preparation, as it were, for the interview itself? Oh yeah, uh, just make sure, of course, that your requirements is complete, of course, and be truthful. Just be truthful to all the information that you put into your application. And of course, uh, maybe don't forget your passport. <laughs> I think it's <laughs> one of the most important requirements. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think that will be all. Just be truthful and just um, make sure to share what, uh, why do you want this? And why do you deserve this scholarship at all? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Yes. I think and I think every time, every the beginning of every interview, we say, you know, why did you, you know, we start off the very, you know, why did you apply? You know, why did you apply for the ACES program? What motivated you? Why this program? Why not any other of the Erasmus Mundus programs or any other aquaculture master's degree? Not so many out there, but you know, you know, that's how we open our interview. So as long as you prepare yourself with that for that, then um, then that's that's a good start, a good start to the interview. And the interviews are 10 minutes long. We're not going to grill you for an hour or two hours or whatever it is. It's just 10 minutes. I think the other thing is also, you know, maybe prepare us to prepare for questioning about your dissertation project, for example, your undergraduate project. Prepare for us to ask you about that in a little bit more detail. You know, what exactly, what skills did you do? 
What skills did you acquire as part of that? What was your role in that um, dissertation project? What kind of st statistics? We love that. Um, what kind of statistics did you use to analyze your data? This is going, you know, you're coming into a master's degree, so we do expect you to be able to um, know some of those statistical tests, for example, but that's not make or break, okay? Because the part of this course is also about, um, there's a lot of self um, learning, there's a lot of um, time and space self-learning and we point you in in the direction of quite a lot of um, online sort of courses and free material um, so there's a lot of time where you can teach yourself um, various new statistical packages or whatever it is that you need to learn so okay that's us so that's i think that's through that sort of application and interview process um that usually Please. yes oh yes it's yes. a question came yes. in yes wonderful yes. yeah excellent so one person is asking, is it mandatory to apply with bachelor certificates while filling the form or they can present it later during interview or the next phase? Yeah, excellent question. Thank you, Pooja. Um, yeah, there's quite a few students that will apply that won't necessarily get their degree until June, July, you know, so they don't so they don't actually um, graduate until a little bit later. So as long as they can share their transcripts, of all the modules and their grades so far throughout, you know, maybe the first, second, third year, maybe it's just the final semester that they don't have their grades for. But usually we ask maybe um, for a letter from the, the, the faculty or head of faculty or something like this, just to say, yes, um, this student, Fear or Zafar is on track to get um, a distinction or whatever it is, or a high to one or whatever the GPA score is for their dissertation or for the final semester. And then we take that into account. So absolutely, the students don't, they don't have to have finished. And uh, Fear and Zafar, did either of you have that situation where you were still completing your undergraduate when you applied? Or had you both yeah. already? Um, actually, uh, I, I as far as I know, there have three people in our cohort that they were also faced this uh, this conditional of a letter first because they uh, they couldn't able to provide their all the transcript. For example, they are just waiting for the final result, or they are just about to finish their final semester. Yeah. So they provide the seven semester uh, transcript, but waiting for the last one. So yeah. finally, they got the unconditional of a letter before. Uh, joining yeah. the program so it's yeah. it's, uh, it's it was quite fine yeah so we just you know so in that instance as, as you say Jafar, we just issue a conditional um acceptance letter just to say yes you've got a place you've got the scholarship either full or partial on the condition that you complete your undergraduate so that's sort of where um, yes. where it stands yeah. yeah there's an, another question about motivation letter like uh, the person is asking that uh, he has no background in aquaculture mm -hmm. and currently he is uh, doing a QC, working as a QC microbiologist in a pharma company. So how he should like argue himself is fitting to the course, mm -hmm. to the aquaculture. So it's like about how to write the motivation letter, how to fit himself to the course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think He's already showing, or they, he or she, they're already yes. showing that they have motivation for this course because they've turned up to this Q&A session, which is a wonderful start. So I think even if they're in a microbiology lab, there must be something that they've seen or some samples that they've, they've worked on that's made them think, oh, maybe I could be one day a microbiologist in Maui or whatever industry, you know, whatever large company, multinational company or, or smaller one within the aquaculture industry, because there are jobs and many jobs for microbiologists within that industry, within the aquaculture industry. So maybe in the motivation statement, you can um, write about what it is, what sparked this interest. Maybe you know someone, maybe you've been to a conference, maybe you've talked to someone that is working within the industry. Just, you know, write that within your within that motivation statement i mean via zafar do you think is that 
<laughs> yeah, actually, I really I actually have a lot of classmates who doesn't have uh, hand to hand um, uh, experience with aquaculture, but yeah. here they are now. We are classmates. Yeah. We are yeah. here in this uh, in this program. So I think, yeah, that's really true that that the fact that he is that they are here right now. I mean, they are really interested. So yeah. I think, uh, yeah, that I think that's a good point. Yeah, thank you. So uh, it's like uh, it's, it's not only like that you have to have experience in aquaculture. So in our module, we also cover the aquaculture environment and society. That means you can go for environmental background. Even you can come from like social studies background. So in case of microbiology, I can say that there have also some modules like uh, fisheries microbiology. So there have a good area that you, where you can work in fisheries microbiology later. So your microbiological knowledge can be applied here also. So you can relate those uh, knowledge that you have already acquired from your job or experience, then you can relate that I can apply it for fisheries sector or fisheries industry. That will be really nice to hear. Yeah, I think so. Thank yeah. you. And yeah. aside from that, you don't have to worry because we also have subjects uh, that is tackling about the aquaculture itself as like a background. So uh, you will know about it in, yeah. uh, in this first semester. And I, and I think that's where, you know, the first module is an overview of global aquaculture. As we say, that's a foundation module where it just brings everyone. It just is just a, a, a beautiful overview of what's happening in the in the industry. And that just brings everyone up to the sort of same level. But it, it doesn't mean to say, though, that in the interviews, quite a few students, they may not have such a background in bivalve aquaculture or finfish or freshwater or what have you. And we will say, look, please spend the summer before you start, please spend the summer doing some background reading around the industry. So, so you're giving yourself a sort of um, a, a little bit of an early start before you actually arrive here. Thanks, Pooja. Are there any other questions? Yes. Mm -hmm. One question is like, uh, I'm a Filipino fisheries enthusiast and graduated from fisheries. And I have and he is asking, like, is it necessary to take ILTS or can I just send proof that English has been a primary language throughout the education? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we still need the IELTS I, because you need it. You I need think it I to know. Get yeah, yeah, yeah from the Philippines. <laughs> Hi, from Philippines. OK, but uh, yeah, that's a good question, but uh, uh, it's one of it's part of the requirements of the ACES to have an IELTS and don't worry. I think that you will. Uh, yeah, I think you will get a good score if you will take that exam. So but yeah, basically it's so uh, it's part of the requirements of the ACES mm -hmm. scholarship. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Bea. And it's it's part of the requirements actually for the UK visa application. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah that's, that's, that's also the main. The, yeah. Um, so it's it's worth, but as you say, Via, you've done all your studying in English throughout your your education. So getting that IELTS should be uh, very very easy yes. for you from the Philippines. It's not so easy from other countries, obviously, which where your course hasn't been taught in English. But if you're from the Philippines, please buy. <laughs> yes, wonderful. Okay. Yes, and there's an, another question about for motivational letter, like uh, what I should. Uh, write in the letter to make it uh, like stand out from others. Oh gosh, to make it stand out from others. Yes, that's like what I should cover that it is considered as a stand out letter. Share tips. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the yeah. two of you. Oh, <laughs> oh, uh, for you me, go? I don't know if it's a stand out, but since I'm here, yeah, I think uh, what I put is my father was a fisherman. My father was uh, my fa my late father was a fisherman, so I also put it. I also put my life, and also one maybe one thing that made my statement kind of you know stand out is because I just didn't put uh, the reason why I'm here just for myself, but of course with my uh, my community, my coastal community. And uh, back then when I was applying, I was an instructor. So I was thinking about my students. So uh, I, it's, not, it's like, it's not just for me. Scholarship is not just for me, but also with my, with my Filipino community and such. 
So I think that could be a good point in this, the statement. Yeah, sorry, just to follow up before Zephyr comes in. I think that's yeah. really that's that's really wonderful to hear you say that, Via. And that is something that, you know, we like to see. It's like when I get to the end of this course, this is what I would like to go on to do. If I mean, it's fine if you don't know that, but this is, you know, and and maybe going back to my home country, maybe becoming part of the of of the movement or part of the industry, going into the industry, going to help them solve the, the key challenges that they're facing at this moment in time to help with um, growing the industry in a sustainable way, because that's something that we really uh, are quite passionate about here with the ACES program. So it's about how you give back and how you become like how you can go on to become an ACE, an ambassador, not just for ACEs, but an ambassador for the industry as well, for the sustainable um, growth of that industry, I think. Yeah, thanks for saying that. Yeah, Jaffa, how, what do you, have you got anything else yeah. to add there? Yeah, actually, uh, to, be, to prepare a outstanding motivation, it's not like that you have to uh, write something like, uh, it's amazing, but be truthful all the time. And if you have a good vision, and if you are dedicated to do something for your society by aquaculture or any other way for your country for the whole universe everything you can write and and presenting your vision in a in a in a, in a quite good way that that can impress the reviewer in my case uh, i worked dedicatedly in one project that uh, work on the new culture system development on seaweed and aqua seaweed and bulb aquaculture in our country because seaweed farming is not familiar in our country so i dedicatedly work here for one year so i showed my potentiality that how i can impact on my country later by taking this course and that's how i think uh, it's motivate my reviewer uh, to get me uh, to provide or offer this scholarship towards me so i think uh, it's not like you have to write something uh, unusual but write whatever you and whatever you think and whatever you would like to see you after two years that's all thank you Sefa. thank you i think we've got time for just one quick question i can't believe an hour's flown by but we've just got one one quick question Peter. yes so someone is asking like uh, he is a greek american living in greece and he has lived here most of his life have has a u.s new citizenship and passport so does he also need to take the ilts test um if he is you if he can no because he's e european american so yes. if, if he uses his european um if he applies under his european passport then he would just pay european fees so if he did go so um so apply he's under saying that and he then has if you american he's saying he has american passport but does he have an uh, does he have an EU passport as well? I wonder. I don't know. He said that uh, he has. Uh, he's living in Greece, but he has US passport, US citizenship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Again, we'd have to just double check whether the UK coming in from using his American passport, whether he would need to have, um, whether to get the UK visa, he would need to have that IELTS test. But um, I presume he would. But if he's living in Greece, then it may be that he is able just to use it. It just depends on the visa and what the visa says he yes. needs. Yeah, yes. that's an interesting one. Every year we get different combinations of students yes. and there's different like, subtleties in visa applications. So, yes. Yes. But, yeah. Um, so, uh, oh, Pooja, we're out oh, yes, of time he now. Is saying, yes, oh. he's saying he has both uh, Greek passport as well. I mean, oh, use the Greek passport, absolutely. And then there is no worries and then there's no way IELTS needed. Yes. Uh, OK, one last question, like uh, the motivational letter has a maximum word limit. So if it's exceeded, is it penalized or something? Yeah, you have to stick to the word limit. Yes, please stick to the word limit. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Right. Well, everyone, thank you so much. Thank you for joining us online. Thank you for your questions. Um, there is the, as I keep saying, there's the ACES uh, website. So that has an awful lot of information on there. And there's a frequently asked questions section as well that people find quite useful. 
um, please do. There's um, aces at sams.ac.uk, which um, is, is an email address as well, where you can ask um, for additional information. But also, I'd really love to thank um, Via and Jafar. Thank you so much for contributing. Um, Dr. Kumari, thank you for fielding those questions and answers and for joining us today. Um, and thank you for our wonderful IT guru um, who has been behind the scenes, um, making sure that this all comes across um, to you just fine. And do remember, um, it's all been recorded, so you can just click on the link that you joined this meeting at, click on that link and it will take you. I think it will be it will be up and running pretty quickly. So if you do want to come back um, and see this um, recording again and go through it again with friends and family, then please do. And please do spread the word. Um, we want to grow this ACES family. You know, we really want, well, it is already global, but we, we want to continue growing this family and um, growing this course. So please do share the, share this, um, share the link um, and make sure that as many um, friends and family and what have you know about this course. And we hope, uh, oh, I look forward to seeing some of you and seeing some of your applications coming in in January. So bye for now. Thank you all so much. Um, and hopefully, See you next year. Bye. Bye.